Hey everybody, it's John Weecroft here with the Sunday Q&A number 29. Although it's not Sunday, I'm recording this on Saturday and various other component parts of this week are going to record just throughout the week uh, as I've got a gig on Sunday, Sunday afternoon and then Sunday evening I'm going to be doing the Guitar Hour podcast. So a bit of a busy time for me at the moment but, uh, but all good. I uh, hope you're keeping well and hope that you're getting some productive work done on the guitar. Got some great questions this week. So we're going to be looking at a variety of different things. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, playing faster bebop lines. That's one thing that we're going to take a look at. We're also going to look at some lines that move in two different directions at once. That's a cool thing that we can check out. Uh, the tune this week is the Weather Report classic Palladium featuring Elliot Henshaw on drums and Rob Statham on the bass. It's a really, really tricky tune to play this. The form is... Uh, is quite perplexing at times, but it's a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I'll see you on the other side of the tune. <laughs>
uh, just having to take every available second at the moment. It's such a busy week. So I'm going to run through five contrary motion ideas. We talked about these a few weeks ago, double stops and the like. So these are going to still be double stops in the main, although they're going to incorporate uh, aspects of contrary motion. That means where one line goes down, the other line goes up, or one goes uh, up, the other one goes down, conversely, and so on. Okay, so let's uh, start by just playing the line. So number one will be, I'll play them a little slow, it's going to be... Pass up type line. We have this line happening at the same time. We have okay. Now, the myth with these kind of phrases is that you learn them as two separate ideas. That's not really how this works at all. The way to learn them is as if it's just one integrated idea with certain notes happening consecutively and the other notes happening in the gaps, shall we say. <clears throat> so, to begin with, with this phrase, we have two octaves or double octave. And we can stagger them. I'm choosing to use picking fingers here, but you could just use finger style. Okay, so it's the root and the root. So this first note goes down to the flat seven, whilst the lowest note goes up to the major third. So that's our first move is. Okay, so what happens next is this flat seven goes down to the six, whilst our low note goes up to the four, and we've got. Okay, then they both go down by semitone, and then another semitone, and that would work. So if you like, as an, end, as an ending though, we maybe want to keep going. So those last notes are... So then they're both on the five. So at this moment, they're both on the same note. So this is going to go chromatically. Because this goes five, six, major seven octave. So we get... Slowly. So that's example number one. With example two, I'm going to change the line around. So what we played here, that's going to occur in the bass. And what we played here, that's going to occur in the treble. So again, I'll do this a little slowly. We're going to get. So initially, both those uh, notes were in two different octaves, but in this instance, they're both going to start on the same note, so that's effectively the low and the high one. Okay, so now, I'll, what previously went is now going to go to the root of the seven in the bass now. What previously went is now going to go, so we're going to get, okay, and we keep going. Trying to be quicker. Okay, now there's a little bit of a finger and conundrum here. And what I suggest you do with this is you use one finger. I'll show you what I mean. So here, just the third finger, first and second, the first and fourth, third and fourth, perhaps. So now for my uh, two fifths. So what's going to happen now is this is going to go. Uh, is this goes so we've got and together so I'm going to go so the second finger is going to stay on that A string and slide with the other fingers pivot around it Example number two. 
example number three comes in two parts based on the amazing guitarist Pirelli Legrand. So let me play the first part for you. So this is 3A. Okay. So the parts are really simple. Uh, one part goes from the five down to the major third, or could be the minor third actually. And the second part goes from the five, six, seven octave. So together we get. Or that's an option there for minor. With this, uh, because it's working on just a pair of strings, any pair of strings between the fourths, I can use the same fingering. So there, this is going from uh, from the fifth degree, so from G, key C. So wherever I can see that, uh, if you can get that in the camera there, it's all available to me. Or a bit low here, that's a bit of a tricky one. It's still possible, you know, to play them everywhere around the guitar. So, like so. Okay, so the development of this is where we add some extra notes from the G7 because that's what's actually happening here. It's going C, uh, G7. So, when we hit this part, we can add extra parts to our G7. We can either do it separately or as double stops in and of itself. And again you can work that in different areas of the guitar, so put that into the camera. It's like as if we're playing a fragmented G7 or fragmented G7 chord in various different areas of the guitar. We did there. So this G7 or C. So uh, one more time here and I did super slow. Okay, so we just start on our fifth degree, the G by itself. Then we've got this uh, third, then we've got a triton. And then we build up our G7. And then we end with C, the third and the tonic C. So in this position, it's into the camera, it's our G. Two variations, or of course we could do this. We could go to minor if we wish. Same. Make that minor now. Okay, so that's number three. Example number four is a double chromatic idea. It mixes these two phrases. One going like so, just going straight down. A phrase that kind of doubles back on itself, and these are two common endings. Okay, I'm sure you're familiar with those two endings, but we're going to combine the two together. So slowly, it's going to go. Now you have a choice here: double them up. So that last note, we're going to play that really slow. So we've got an octave, and they're both the fifth degree. And they go down. Now here's where they change direction. The top one continues to go down. The bottom one's going up. Now we're going to switch strings now. Splits. Now both on the same note, or you could just play the highest one. Slow. Or you could do it straight. Example five is a slight uh, change of direction here. This is going to be a 12 tone row. And what this is, is where you play all 12 notes of the chromatic scale, but in such an order that no notes are repeated and all 12 notes are represented. And they can give a glorious kind of outside, free, sort of atonal feeling to proceedings. So 
So they're, they're really useful to have a couple of these under your fingers. So this is a really simple one, and it's based around the idea of, in the key of C, I'm going to move this to around the third fret area. So I'm going to bisect the octave. So I'm saying it's in the tonality of C, but as it's atonal, it could really be in any key. But I'm thinking of this in C, with the, the first note being right in the middle, the G flat or the F sharp. Okay, and the, the idea here is that one um, of these uh, opposing motion lines is going down. So it's going to go uh, descend. And the other one is going to go up. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, here's the central location, down, up, down. Location, perhaps, so you can play the same thing here. Okay. Or I could play the same thing with it one more time slow. Well, you have a choice there. You can play them on the E and the A string if you wish. Okay, and then I'll play, maybe I'll play it here. Again. Super slow. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. And then that's the 12 tone row finished, but just for good measure, I'll play the octave there at the end. So one more time. different day a different room but uh, we will get this week done by any means necessary so uh, so yeah so this this subject that we're going to look at now relates to a topic that we first explored two weeks earlier uh, a question from Dan about improvising and trying to make things happen uh, when uh, there's no kind of initial inspiration uh, just making ideas come out of fresh air so to speak uh, and this is a little game if you like that, uh, that I borrowed from the great drummer Bob Moses. Uh, Bob does this uh, when he freely improvises on his kind of extended drum kit. He's got a, a drum kit with uh, you know, more than one bass drum, more than one snare drum, various percussion um, uh, instruments kind of added, dotted around the place. It sounds amazing. Uh, but he calls this thing zones. And what it means is he starts off with a limited range of sounds. And it starts to gradually increase different um, different sounds, different drums moving around, maybe on one sound source, then introducing the second. Then once he's, he's uh, explored that idea, he'll introduce the third, maybe drop the first one off and move it to a different area. And this might take place over you know, many minutes, maybe you know 10 minutes or so. Um, but he moves it around uh, so that he's always introducing new sounds, uh, and it sounds varied, and it also gives him kind of uh, well, lots of different colors to the sound. So I figured we could do exactly the same thing, but instead of using different drums, we just do uh, different notes. So with this in mind, we'll start off with just one note, and we can be as tonal or, or not as we wish. So this could be as inside or as chromatic or whatever it might be. It's, I'm just going to let it happen. right? So I'm not going to plan anything here other than the fact that I've decided my initial note's going to be an A. Okay, so that's that's where we're going to start. So I might pick a rhythm. I'm going to go. Okay. Five. 
notes happening there. So start with just one note. Then introduce the second note. Add a third. Maybe then add a chromaticism. Six notes is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven notes. So seven notes. Okay. So then, what you could do with this? Pick different rhythms. Pick different ranges. Maybe even pick things that are way far, uh, way far apart that are not really close to one another. So maybe I'll do something like uh, pick this. You know. Okay, so then we might flesh that out. So that's kind of an interesting thing there where, where I was playing notes that separated by two octaves and a major third, and then play some like supporting notes in the center. And it could be as chromatic or you know as, as tonal as you like. So with this in mind. I'm thinking less in terms of like licks and stuff like that, and more in terms of like developing motifs, developing a rhythmic idea. Uh, you could just really, really, really limit yourself to like a select few notes. So, for argument's sake, uh, I'll pick these three. Okay, so there I introduced the second note. What was the third one? Did that, didn't I? So that could be our kind of group of notes. of it you know so we start with one note introduce a second then once that's uh, you've got something happening there maybe bring a third in but only when you've got stuff happening if it's not working break it back down to one note again you know you should really get used to the concept of playing with rhythm you know there I've kind of fallen into a kind of a similar groove but of course you, know, you can pick any rhythm you want you know you can even do this against something that's tonal or against something that's uh, that's more fleshed out you know play over a backing track imagine playing through a a whole tune, you know, play over a standard or something like that. But you, you literally could just play you know, one finger, you know, along the length of one string, moving the minimum distance. You know, if you can apply this to changes, then you'll find yourself doing this kind of thing when you're in a band situation. Uh, maybe my um, uh, last thought on this topic, something that could be very interesting and can be a lot of fun, is to do this with another musician. So instead of it just being you by yourself play with someone else and you can both play around but limit yourself to very you know to one note each or whatever and then as one of you gets busier the other one could get busier too or as one gets more involved the other one regresses and becomes less involved you know um there's plenty of ways of doing this now in in advance of that as a way of practicing that sort of interaction what you could try doing and this is a really cool thing to do and i do this quite a bit is record yourself doing this uh, these zones or whatever. I know uh, uh, Joe Diorio calls this gesturing improvising. I think, but I, th I think with him it moves around a lot more. You know, rather than uh, where I'm restricting myself to less notes. But by the time you know you develop this, if you do this for ten minutes, by the end you know anything could be happening. Uh, but you could record that, and so you record that, and that's kind of part number one. And then kind of leave it alone. Don't don't listen back to it that instant because. 
you're going to be listening to it critically for the most part, trying to find fault with it. I find just sit on that, just record it, and then don't touch it for 24 hours or more. Okay, leave it so that you've forgotten it. Uh, and then the next day, first thing I suggest you do is listen back to it and just see if any of it's any good. And then secondly, you could accompany yourself. So improvise, react to the improvisation that you made previously and see if you can find a way to play in the spaces. And then that'll tell you if you're playing too much as well, you know, if you think that there's no way in here. Like, I find it very difficult to actually find anything to say that fits with what you just played. Well, that's what your accompanist is going to think if you were doing this with another player. So then you can then repeat the process with that in mind. If you go, okay, well, I know I've got to leave myself some spaces here because I want to, to accompany my own playing. Well, then you'll play with that level of sensitivity when you play with other musicians. So it's just an idea. And all of these things are, they're just games, if you like, little activities that you can use. Restriction exercises, I think we talked about. Uh, once again, just to reiterate what I said two weeks ago, I'd strongly suggest you get a hold of Nick Goodrick's book, The Advancing Guitarist. It's full of this kind of stuff. And if I'm being honest, one of the reasons why I'm even open to the suggestion of doing these things is probably from reading Nick's book at a quite impressionable age, sort of late teens or whatever. Um, and every time I look at that book, I find something new in it. So it's something that I would suggest that you do the same. You'd be in good company. A lot of the world's best players, you know, have definitely seen that book, you know, and, and it's influenced the way they teach, you know. If I see Steve Vai's guitar masterclasses, I, I know pretty pretty much for certain that he's read The Advancing Guitarist because it's the same methods, the way that he advocates sticking on one thing, you know, work on your vibrato of going from, you know, or bend going from D to E, but for like half an hour, you know, I can really work on that and you'll find lots and lots of different ways of doing that that maybe you wouldn't previously have, uh, have discovered. If you just do it on the surface level, do it once for a couple of minutes and then move on to the next thing. Or maybe you've not spent enough time on this. So, so I would suggest use a timer on your phone to give yourself sort of 20 minutes on this or whatever and you'll lose yourself in the music, you know, once you get rid of the inhibition. Uh, so maybe, yeah, the last thought on this would be uh, at first, it's maybe a good idea to do this when you've not got a video camera on you, um, you know, or when someone else can hear you. I would suggest doing it like sort of where you can, you can feel comfortable in it not sounding great. Like if you if you are trying this out and it's not working, that's okay. You've got to feel like you've got to let go of the inhibitions of it sounding amazing instantly. Uh, it's more about the process than about the outcome. This I think. So yeah. So good luck with this, and uh, yeah, I hope uh, that you get something out of it. I had a question from Jack about some of the faster phrasing, uh, some fast bebop lines, this kind of thing. kind of like uh, semi-quaver style lines so I thought I'd just share a few ideas about uh, how I go about executing these type of ideas anyway so the first thing is is it's not every note picked so that might be something that um, might be quite surprising really it's I at one point went under the misapprehension that you basically had two choices when it came to picking the two choices being that you were a player who picked absolutely everything. So like Pat Martino style. So if I was playing those kind of lines, everything, every single note is going to be picked. Or it was more legato, like Alan, Alan Holdsworth, that kind of thing, where everything's uh, hammered. Most notes are hammered. Uh, at some stage, it became. Uh, I became aware of the fact that there's a middle ground where you can pick some of the notes. It may have actually been that John Schofield video. I don't know if you've seen it. It's definitely worth seeing. I think it's called John Schofield on Improvisation. And someone asks him about his picking. And he says, I've got really bad alternate picking. I just don't do it. You know, it's a, a combination of picking and hammer-ons and pull-offs. But not in the rock sense where you pick one note and hammer on a whole bunch. He was talking about where you... Uh, you pick maybe two notes and then hammer on the last one. So I've developed a technique that's kind of based around that. Uh, I do use the fingers as well sometimes, but maybe that's a subject for, for another day. I use them quite a lot on electric guitars. Um, 
But for now, I'm just going to deal with the concept of mixing pick notes with hammer-ons and pull-offs. So, for the most part, what we're talking about here is occasional hammer-ons and pull-offs to facilitate the line, the bounce of a line. And for me, most of the time, that's the note prior to a string change. So if I were to play a scalar idea, so say in this case this is all deep Dorian, say I was to play that kind of thing, what I might do is go pick, pick, hammer, pick, Reverse might be pick, pick, pull, pick, pick, pull, pick, pick, pull. Pull. And then maybe in the middle. So there, there's a pick, pull off, pick, pick. Same there. There's pick, pull, pick, pick. So I'm playing like little bursts of picking rather than uh, picking every note. And I find that allows me to loosen up the feel somewhat. So I'm gonna show you some examples of how you might put this into practice. So we're gonna look at just two specific semi-quaver type lines. It's phrase one. different swing feels there. One was more swinging, one was a little bit straighter, but the notes are coming from D Dorian. We start on an E and then we play some chromaticism. Then another chromatic idea here. Another chromatic idea. Straight off the table of Pat Martino, yeah. So this is like the kind of thing you hear Pat Martino play amazingly well. Pat tends to uh, pick most notes, whereas you may notice when I played fast, I was picking way less. So it, for me, it would pop, probably be pull. So pick, pick, pull. Now this part here, I'm dummying the notes on the A string. Slow, I would pick them. At speed, I might go. Hammering them on without picking them. So they, they're almost inaudible. So like a, a phrase here at the top, it's pick, 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 pull. And there's that idea of picking up to the string change. So where the string change happens, that's where you need the help to get to the next string. So I pick, 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 pull. Same again. So it's every note, except the note prior to the change of string. So if I had to define a kind of a rule for this, it's, it's essentially like alternate picking, but as you approach a string change, then we include some kind of hammer on or pull off. It's not quite as scientific as that, because sometimes it happens on a single string to create a sense of bounce. So instead of it going, I might go pick, pull, there's a pull in the middle of the phrase. And again. I kind of, it's akin to this, right? This is, this is my analogy for this. Alternate picking feels like if you had a bicycle upturned and you wanted to spin the wheel, for me it feels like you keep hold of the wheel all the time and you're just pushing it around but whilst keeping it in your hand. Legato playing is you just give it one great big almighty push and it spins. This is kind of like we're spinning the wheel by repeatedly pushing the wheel round. Uh, so you pick just to keep the, the, uh, the attack and keep the momentum happening, but it's not every note and it's also not as uh, sort of dynamically like weak in a way as legato playing where you only pick one note and hammer a bunch. That wouldn't really work with a super clean sound like this. It's totally clean. 
So, really slowly, and I'll, I'll try to mimic the picking that I would use if it were fast. It's difficult to do because as you slow it down, you tend to do things in a different way. So I'll try to emulate the picking here. It's gonna be pick, pick, pull, pick, pick, hammer, hammer. Now there, I think I went, I think I went pick, pull, yeah. Everything picked, pull, pull. I think maybe the B string I did something different there. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing. If you want things more articulate, you can just pick more notes. Sometimes I want it to be smoother. I'm kind of picking each alternate note there, that's a Schofield type thing. Uh, or I want it to be more articulate and I'll pick most of the notes, but never, almost never all of them. Almost never is it going to be all of them. So that's phrase number one. sense so there's number one it's phrase number two a uh, shorter phrase in a different area of the neck uh, okay maybe this points of interest here hopefully so the first one is but let's learn the notes to start with so it starts on the minor third goes to the major seven and then it closes the root by going above below root then up the scale skip now a little chromatic idea that goes What's happening here is it's essentially the Dorian mode with some chromatic, with some chromatic connection notes and some enclosures. So an enclosure means when you go below, above, and hit the note, or above, below, and then hit the note, of course, by using the semitone above. We mentioned them uh, last week when looking at those uh, basic Django arpeggios. Okay, now, so the first point to notice here is how you should become fluent with moving these ideas around. So in this instance, I'm seeing the root D here, but I can also see it here. And as it's a three string phrase, I can trans uh, transfer that to any group of three strings. So the picking here, what's happening, some instances I'm picking the bass string and others I'm not. I'll just hammer it on from nowhere. Using that sort of like spinning the wheel philosophy there. It gives it a different bounce, you know, it's, it's a choice based upon sonic considerations rather than technical ones. But say we pick it, right, we'll pick it, then with the hammer on, hammer on, pick, To approach. So here I'll do it and I'll definitely hammer. So I didn't pick the D string at all. Just hammered on from nowhere as opposed to 
which is kind of more articulate but a bit stiff sounding. That kind of thing. Okay, so. snappy and it will work with a completely clean sound although it's not all picked so that's example number two whilst there are a huge number of chromatic options available to you let me give you somewhere to begin by showing you three simple ways to connect up the scale okay so if I group the scale in three note uh, pairings if you like three note groups I'm gonna get this this is D Dorian or C major scale along the E string so I'm gonna see say I'll go from G with two tones tone and a semitone, a semitone and a tone, two tones, a tone and a semitone, and a semitone and a tone. So if I have a way of approaching each of those three different shapes, there's only three shapes, there's a tone with a semitone, that happens here. Semitone with a tone, and this is on every string, yeah? I want two consecutive tones. Okay, so the first one I'll do is the semitone with a tone. Anywhere I see this, and go. So I'll slow them down so you've got them. So wherever we see a tone and a semitone, I might go. And again, I use that idea of not necessarily always picking every note. Where I see a semitone followed by a tone, I might go. And where I see two consecutive tones, Can do this at any point within a scale so if you combine that with a little bit of kind of arpeggio type uh, motion where you break the arpeggios up then of course we need to concern ourselves with the semitone gaps when you go from string to string but again that could be a, a topic for another day hopefully this gives you some insight as to where these fast uh, bebop style lines are coming from i hope you got something from this material today and uh, once again thanks for getting this far i really appreciate you checking this out so as always, any comments, likes, shares, or just letting somebody know, let people know that this is out there if you think that they might find it useful or helpful. That's really, really cool. I really appreciate it. Um, hope you have a great week. I uh, hope you, you get lots of great practice done. 
Uh, things are beginning to get a bit busier. It looks like uh, we may have some light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, I hope that uh, you stay safe and stay positive. Take care of yourself and I'll see you next time.